Hello and welcome to Books of Blood. My name is John and today I'm going to be doing my November TBR video for you guys. So let me see, it looks like I've got about uh, maybe 10 books here for my November TBR. Uh, I got some older books and we're talking about old school horror from back in the 70s. Uh, I got some coming of age. Uh, I think I've got, uh, I don't know what, I, what all I've got. So let's go ahead and just get underway with this. So starting off, we got one that was published, and when was this published? It might not have been the 70s. 1974, it's by Jeffrey Convitz, and this is The Sentinel. Uh, I just have not gotten around to reading this book yet, so I figured now would be the time to give it a, give it a shot, all right? A novel that takes you to the very boundaries of belief and one shattering step beyond, The Sentinel. A beautiful young model, the old brownstone apartment she simply had to have, the grotesque blind priest who watched down on her day and night from an upper story window, the pair of perverted creatures who wanted her to join their circle, the mad little old man who gave her tea and sympathy, the cool, calculating, supremely rational lover who first mocked her fears, and the secret you will never be able to forget, even if you try. And that is The Sentinel, and of course that was made into a movie back in the 70s. I believe it starred Christina Raines, uh, who is the daughter of the late Claude Raines, who played the uh, universal monster, the Invisible Man. There you go. Alright, so now I got one. I have heard Nick from Spooky Noodles talk about this book. He's talked about it on his channel. He's talked about it on Instagram. Talked about it everywhere. I am finally going to get around to reading Fear by Ronald Kelly. Alright? And uh, from what I understand, this is a coming-of-age book, if I'm correct about that. Where are the children? It was a legend in Fear County, a hideous, flesh-eating creature that feasted on the blood of innocent children in the cold, black heart of the Tennessee backwoods. But ten-year-old Jeb Sweeney knows the terrible stories are true. His best friend Mandy just up and disappeared. He also knows that no one has ever had the courage to go after the monster and put an end to its raging, bestial hunger. Until now. But evil is well guarded, and for young Jeb Sweeney, about to enter the lair of the unknown, passage through the gates of hell comes with a terrible price. Everlasting fear. Alright, so we got fear by Ronald Kelly. Okay. Alright, now I was going to say, I couldn't remember what else it was I had on this thing, so i got coming of age, i got some old school horror, and I've got some folk horror represented in a couple of books here. As you can tell by the thumbnail, I used the uh, the wallpaper from the movie Midsummer, which is one of my favorite movies, and it's one of my favorite folk horror movies. Uh, so yeah, that's why I used that thumbnail. But anyway, first off, we got Ramsey Campbell's The Hungry Moon. I've never read this. Uh, Ramsey Campbell has always been kind of hit and miss for me. Uh... I have to really get into it at the very beginning of the book to be able to enjoy Ramsey. Sometimes that just doesn't happen, and other times I might go in and say, you know, well, I'll give it another shot. But anyway, I've never read this. Uh, Moonwell, a quiet little town where for generations the people have gathered on Midsummer's Eve to decorate a cave with flowers, echoing ancient Druid customs. And there comes an evangelist, a spellbinder, to halt this pagan activity. First he puts a stop to descent, then he enters the pit to vanquish the forces that lurk there. Only a few resist him, battling the rising fanaticism of the town. Only a few understand what really happens in the pit. Only a few worry about the spreading darkness and the nearness of the nuclear missile base. And that is The Hungry Moon by Ramsey Campbell. That's a paperback. All right. Alright, so next up I got one that uh, Cameron, Cameron Chaney from over at Library Macabre uh, sent to me for Christmas this past year, and this is Standalone. It's by Paul Michael Anderson. I think I've talked about this book a little bit on my channel before. They are killers. They are monsters. They are evil. They stalk through summer camps, abandoned hospitals, run-down schools, and isolated houses, hunting anyone foolish enough to visit these places, leaving behind carnage, terror, death, and destruction. Sometimes there are survivors. Always there is blood. And they do it to protect and preserve all of existence across the, un the multiverse. Excuse me. 
but now they are the ones being stalked and hunted, and life as we know it hangs in the balance unless they figure out a way to survive. That is Standalone by Paul Michael Anderson. Okay. And it's another one I've heard so much about, so many good things about. I'm finally going to get around to reading this, but this is by Stephen Graham Jones. And this is actually my first book by Stephen Graham Jones, and this is The Only Good Indians. A tale of revenge, cultural identity, and the cost of breaking from tradition in this latest novel from the Jordan Peele of horror literature, Stephen Graham Jones. Seamlessly blending classic horror and a dramatic narrative with sharp, sharp social commentary, The Only Good Indians follows four American Indian men after a disturbing event from their youth puts them in a desperate struggle for their lives. Tracked by an entity bent on revenge, these childhood friends are helpless as the culture and traditions they left behind, catch up to them in a violent, vengeful way. And that is the only good Indians. Alright. Okay. And this one here, I have heard E.D. Lewis talk about on his channel, E.D. Lewis Reviews. Uh, this is one of those books from uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren, uh, so it's supposed to be based on a true haunting. Uh, this is In a Dark Place, and this, uh, I believe, is by the Warrens with Carmen Reed and Al Snedeker with Ray Garten, who, of course, is a uh, novelist in his own right. Ray Garten is a horror novelist and a very good one, too. All right. If you haven't read Ravenous, you, you're missing on, out on an awesome werewolf novel. All right. Just read Ravenous. Bestials is the sequel to it. It's not as good, I don't think, but Ravenous is pretty damn awesome. Okay. This story, the most terrifying case of demonic possession in the United States, became the basis for the hit film The Haunting in Connecticut, starring Virginia Madsen. Shortly after moving into their new home, the Snedeker family is assaulted by a sinister presence that preys upon them one by one. Exhausting other resources, they turn to world-renowned demonologist Ed and Lorraine Warren, the paranormal investigators portrayed in the blockbuster film The Conjuring. But even the Warrens have never encountered a case as frightening as this. No one warned the Snedekers that their new house was once an old funeral home, and their battle with inexplicable and savage phenomena has only just begun. What starts as a simple poltergeist soon escalates into a full-scale war between an average American family and the deepest, darkest forces of evil, a war this family can't afford to lose. Don't miss the blockbuster film based on the Warren's true experiences, The Conjuring and Annabelle. Or blockbuster film, excuse me. But that was a little thing. Probably didn't even need to read that. Anyway, this is in a dark place. This is the only one I've got. Uh, I was going to get some more of these books. Uh, I had uh, Barnes & Noble, and it just seems like they've gone off the shelves, you know. But, hey, you know how people are. They, you know, something's popular, and they, they, cap, they, they jump on it, all right? All right. Uh, next up, this one I've heard Merce over at Harpies in the Trees talk about, and uh, I trust Merce's judgment. So I am going to try to read Adam Neville's No One Gets Out Alive. I want to read it before I take a shot at the, the Netflix movie. Please, nobody spoil the movie for me. Nobody tell me if they hated it, liked it. Don't tell me if they thought it was bad. I want to go to it with fresh eyes. I would appreciate that, guys. Thank you very much. All right. When Stephanie moves to a notoriously cheap neighborhood of Birmingham, she's happy to find an affordable room for rent that's just large enough not to deserve her previous room's nickname, The Cell. The eccentric, albeit slightly overly friendly, landlord seems nice and welcoming. The ceilings are high and all of the other tenants are also girls. Things aren't great, but they're stable. Or at least that's what she tells herself when she impulsively hands over the money to cover the first month's rent and decides to give it a go. But soon after, she becomes uneasy about her rash decision. She hears things in the night, feels them, things or people who aren't there in the light, who couldn't be there because, after all, her door is locked every night and the key is still in place in the morning. Concern soon turns to terror when the voices she hears and presence she feels each night becomes hostile. It's clear that something very bad has happened in this house and something even worse is happening now. Stephanie has to find a way out before whatever's going on in the house finds her first. And that is No One Gets Out Alive by Adam Neville. All right. 
and these last four books I've talked about before on my channel uh, with my uh, like book hauls and stuff. Uh, the first one we got is Mouthful of Ashes, and this is by Brianna Morgan. Uh, and this one really has echoes of the Lost Boys in it, just by reading the uh, synopsis. Mourning the sudden loss of her sister, Callie Danoff wants nothing more than to embrace a fresh start in a new town, leaving the haunting memories of her sister's death behind. But when her brother Ramsey drags her, drags her to a spooky boardwalk, the two become entangled with the local vampire gang and its enigmatic leader, Elijah. Callie refuses to accept their existence until she and her brother unknowingly ingest vampire blood. Now they only have three days before they turn into vampires themselves. With her carefree summer thwarted, Callie must trust a group she barely knows in order to save her family. And that is Mouthful of Ashes by Brianna Morgan. And another one I've talked about just a little while ago, or a couple of videos ago. Actually, yeah, one or two videos ago. Uh, this is Queen of Teeth by Haley Piper. All right. Within 48 hours, Yaya Betancourt will go from discovering teeth between her thighs to being hunted by one of the most powerful corporations in America. She assumes the vagina dentata is a side effect of a rare genetic condition caused by Alpha Beta Pharmaceutical decades ago when she and several thousand others were still in the womb. But when ABP's corporate goons up in her life, she realizes her secondary teeth might be evidence of a new experiment for which she's the most advanced test tube. A situation worse than when Yaya's or Yaya's or Yaya, I'm going to say Yaya. Condition spreads, ho sprouts horns, tentacles, and a mind of its own. On the run and transforming, Yaya may be either ABP's greatest success or the deadliest failure science has ever created. So, it sounds like a little bit of a cross between a uh, little bit of, I don't know, would you say cosmic horror? I don't know, maybe. Uh, body horror for sure, and a little bit, a little bit sci-fi going on there too. All right. Anyway, that is Queen of Teeth by Haley Piper. And one thing I said about Haley Piper is I loved her story or her book, um, The Possession of Natalie Glasgow. Uh, totally took me places I did not expect this book to take me. I figured it's going to be, you know, what? Read it. Just read it. I'm not going to spoil nothing for you. All right. Uh, next up, we have another one that is uh, could be considered folk horror. In fact, the last two, I'm pretty sure, are going to be kind of along the, along the lines of folk horror or maybe thrillers. I'm not 100% sure, but I think this one will be. This is Horseman by Christina Henry. And that is an awesome cover. I mean, seriously, that is just a freaking awesome cover. Everyone in Sleepy Hollow knows about the horseman, but what no one really believes in him. Not even Ben Van Brunt's grandfather, Brom Bones, who was there when it was said the horseman chased the upstart Ichabod Crane out of town. Brom says that's just legend. The village gossips talking. More than 30 years after these, those storied events, the village is in a quiet place. 14-year-old Ben loves to play Sleepy Hollow Boys, reenacting the events Brom once lived through. But then Brahm and a friend stumble upon across the headless body of a child in the woods near the village, and the discovery makes Ben question everything the adults in Sleepy Hollow have ever said. Could the horseman be real after all, or does something even more sinister stalk the woods? And that is Horseman, and that's by Christina Henry. Okay. And finally, I have got... And this is one of those ones. Somebody finally told me what these are. These are deckled pages. You see how they look kind of rough? They're called deckled pages. And these are called French flaps. So there you go. Thank you. I can't remember who it was that told me that. They had a, uh, like four words in their name. I can't remember. But thank you for telling me that. I appreciate it. So anyways, this is A God in the Shed. And this is by J.F. Dubow. Interesting how he has his first name. So it's J and then a dash and an F with a period. So I am figuring the F is an initial for something and it's not just J or anyway, but yeah, they're both initials. Anyway, this is a God in the Shed. Let's see what it says here. 
The village of St. Ferdinand has all the trappings of a quiet life. Farmhouses stretching from one main street, a small police precinct, a few diners and cafes, and a grocery store. Though if an out-of-towner stopped in, they would notice one unusual thing. A cemetery far too large and much too full for such a small town, lined with the victims of the St. Ferdinand killer, who has eluded police for nearly two decades. It's not until after Inspector Stephen Crowley finally catches the killer that the town discovers even darker forces are at play. When a dark spirit reveals itself to young Venus McKenzie, a resident of St. Ferdinand, she learns that this creature's power has a long history with her town, and that the serial murders merely scratch the surface of a past burdened by evil secrets. Dun, dun, dun. Anyway, that is it. That is my November TBR. So what have I got here? I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I said 10. I was close. I was off by 1. All right. Anyway, this is going to post on Monday the 24th. 24th? I think today's the 23rd. So it's going to post on Monday the 24th. Anyway, until then, take care and stay scared. Bye-bye.